Hey, it's Michelle, your CXC Biology Tutor. In this past paper solutions video, I'll be looking at the Biology January 2017 Paper 2, and I'll be focusing on Question 1. So let's get started. Alright, so we have Question 1A. A group of students conducts an experiment to investigate the rate of reaction of enzyme X at different temperatures. The results of the experiment are shown in Table 1. So we have the temperature values here in this column, right up to 50 degrees Celsius, or from 0 to 50 degrees Celsius. And then we have the values for the rate of reaction of enzyme X. So that is in milligrams of product per minute. So it's just showing you how fast enzyme X would react, how fast it would convert substrate into product. So we're going to have to plot a graph. So that is what the first part of the question asks. Plot the data in table 1 on this grid below. So I have the graph plotted already. So you would have your, your rate of reaction on the y-axis in milligrams per minute. So you can see the scale that I've used and it go up to 25 because the highest temperature, the highest rate of reaction, sorry, is actually 24. So we're going to go up to that scale in fives and then on the x-axis we have the temperature values, the temperature scale. So we go from 0 degrees Celsius right up to 50 degrees Celsius. So it would have gone up in fives. So this is how your curve should look. So pretty much like a mountain. Alright, so let's go to the next part of the question. So part two says use the graph plotted in A1 to identify the optimum temperature for enzyme X. So I have that the optimum temperature is 30 degrees Celsius. So let's look at the graph and see how we get that. So if you look at the graph, the optimum temperature is represented by the peak of the graph, the peak of the curve. So that's the top of the mountain. So you look and you see that at the top, so that is when the reaction rate is at its highest. So that is at 24 milligrams per minute. And then you will simply come down to see what temperature that is at. So that is 30 degrees Celsius. So that is when the reaction is the fastest. Okay, so part three now. Account for the shape of the graph between 5 degrees Celsius and 30 degrees Celsius. So let's go back. So 5 degrees Celsius and 30 degrees Celsius. So that is within this range here. So 5 degrees Celsius right up to 30 degrees Celsius, which was the optimum. So you can see that there is a general increase in the rate of reaction as the temperature is being increased right up to the optimum temperature. So you say as the temperature increases, the rate of reaction increases up until the optimum temperature. So that is pretty much what you call an, an exponential increase. So it's, it's gradually increasing as temperature increases. So the enzyme really requires heat. So this is just the explanation for why this would occur. The enzyme requires heat to pretty much provide the energy for the reactant. So these are the substrates that the enzyme is going to be reacting with. So they need to be energized and they collide more frequently with each other and also the enzyme so that the reaction can get going. So we need some level of energy so that as the temperature is increasing, that's why you have that increased rate of reaction up until the optimum temperature where the rate of reaction would be the highest. So now we have to account for the shape of the graph above 40 degrees Celsius. So let's look at the graph again. So beyond the point of 40 degrees Celsius, so we're looking at 40 degrees Celsius, what do you notice? You can see that there is a, a rapid decline in the rate of reaction right down to 50, 50 degrees Celsius. So beyond this temperature, this, 50, this 40 degrees Celsius, you realize that the heat is going to cause the enzyme to be denatured. So your knowledge of how how enzymes behave, you know that too much heat can cause the enzyme to be denatured. So pretty much the shape of the enzyme becomes unraveled and it's pretty much destroyed and it cannot function as it should. 
So the rate of reaction will therefore slow down till it reaches zero when the reaction stops completely at the 50 degrees Celsius. All right, so part four, state one precaution that the student should take when carrying out this experiment. So you need to really be monitoring the temperature closely. Ensure that you're reading the temperature value on the thermometer properly and that the enzyme, the enzyme is kept at the right temperature for each stage of the experiment. So the enzyme, obviously in combination with the substrate that is going to be acting on that solution, you need to make sure that the temperatures are kept at the correct temperature for each stage of the experiment. So that is one precaution that you can consider. All right, let's look at part B. Part one, name two enzymes that break down protein. So the two enzymes are pepsin and trypsin. And you can also mention renin. Renin is a special protein enzyme for milk protein. It's very important in clotting, helping clot the milk protein. So the two main ones that you can mention are the pepsin and the trypsin. Part two, name two parts of the human alimentary canal where enzymes that break down protein are found. So this would be in the stomach and the small intestines. So that's where you would find the two enzymes that we just mentioned above. So part three, suggest two reasons why the different enzymes for breaking down proteins are located in two different parts of the alimentary canal. So the pepsin enzyme, you should be familiar with this enzyme and know that it is found in the stomach where it is acidic. So the enzyme functions best optimally at a low pH. So that is between one to two. So the optimum, the optimum pH for the pepsin enzyme is very, very low. So therefore within the stomach where you have the hydrochloric acid, so that gives it that acid environment. So the pepsin will work best under those conditions. Now on the other hand, the trypsin enzyme will be found in the small intestines, a totally different environment. So in here now, we have a neutral to alkaline pH. So the pH is roughly between seven to eight. So the trypsin enzyme works best under these, these conditions, these neutral to alkaline conditions. All right, so let's look at part C. Leguminous plants such as peanuts are able to manufacture proteins with the help of nitrogen fixing bacteria that live in the nodules on their roots. Part one, identify the type of relationship that exists between the peanut plant and the, the bacteria. So we're looking at symbiotic relationships in this case, and there are three of them. There's mutualism, there's commensalism, and there's parasitism. So this relationship that exists between the peanut plant and the bacteria would be mutualism. So both organisms are actually benefiting from the relationship. So now in part two, we have to explain your answer, the answer that would have been given. So we mentioned that the relationship is mutualistic. It's a mutualism relationship. So the bacteria, they live within the root nodules of the peanut plant. So they're going to benefit from having a home, a shelter, place to live, and they can also obtain any nutrients available from the plant. So that's how the bacteria are going to be benefiting. Now the plant benefits from obtaining the nutrients, especially the nitrates in particular, from the nitrogen fixing bacteria. So these nitrogen fixing bacteria are known to utilize nitrogen gas from the air and they are able to convert it into ammonium or nitrates so that the plants can then absorb and then these nitrates can be assimilated into the cells of the plant and then used to form protein. So this is pretty much how the plant will be able to make its own protein. So that's how the plant is going to benefit. They need these bacteria, these nitrogen fixing bacteria to produce the nitrates that they need. All right, let's look at part three. Describe a suitable procedure for testing the presence of protein in peanuts. So we're going to look at the protein test, which is the burette test. So that will be performed on the peanuts. So first of all, you need to crush the peanuts up, mix in some water to form a solution in a test tube. And then you're going to add a few drops of the burette solution. The burette solution contains copper sulfate 
and sodium hydroxide and it's usually a blue solution so when you add the few drops of burette solution you shake that up with the peanut solution so you mix them carefully mix all the contents properly and then you should notice a color change from blue to purple because you should expect that peanuts would have in protein and that is the color change that it will be expected when protein is present so you go from the blue color to a purple or mauve color all right so part four the final part of question one suggests two reasons why plants need protein so generally protein is needed for growth and repair so the plants will need the proteins for making and building up the cells in the various plant tissues. So it needs the cells to form the leaves, the stems, the roots, and then it enables the plant to grow properly and not be stunted in height. So a plant that is lacking in protein can be very stunted, it can be shorter than normal. So protein is needed for growth and repair to ensure that the plant is growing properly. All right, so that is the end of question one.